Fast moving targets live from Eurosonic Norderslag Buma Music uh, meets uh, Tech. The second day, second day of interviews uh, over here. Uh, it's early. We're drinking coffee, uh, drinking uh, orange juice. Uh, do you need it at the at, at, a, at a late night? There's only so many times you come to Groningen and not go out and see some amazing bands. So I had a good night last night. Yeah. Hey, and and who are you and, and what do you do? Who am I? So Chris Carey. I'm CEO of Media Insight Consulting, the longest job company name in the world, but there we go. Um, we do data analytics for companies like Sony Music, Spotify, the O2 Arena in London, um, and I also run a music conference called Fast Forward that's happening in Amsterdam on the 4th and 5th of February. Okay, then we should be there, I assume? Well, I, if you would like to come, you'd be ever so welcome. It should be really, really, really good. Yeah. Hey, um, uh, so you're, uh, you're a data specialist. Uh, data is an important uh, subject on the, on the Boomer Music uh, uh, meets, meets uh, tech. Um, why is uh, data important to you? Um, so for me, I'm an economist by background. I used to be Global Insight Director at EMI and then Global Insight Director at Universal. So it's always been a big part of my career. But for me, it's funny. People introduce me and say, this is Chris, he's a data guy. I hate that. Yeah. I don't, I don't like data. I like what you can do with it. I like that I've got a question and I can now get a much better answer because there's data in the way that will help me get there. So for me, it's not about data itself. It's about asking great questions and getting great answers. Data is just somewhere in between. Can you give me some examples of the, um, uh, the questions and answers you're, uh, you've been involved in and, and, and that are good examples of why it's so interesting? Yes, certainly. So for me, you can ask consumers anything. You can ask them, have you heard of this band? Do you like the band? Because already you've then got a segmented market. You've got the people who have never heard of you and the people who've heard of you and don't like you. You treat these groups very differently. That's a really basic way of looking at a market. You can take that to an extreme and say actually to the consumer, what do you like to buy? Where do you like to discover music? And how much do you like to spend? At which point you can now identify high value customers and you know where they spend their time online and you want to know how they can discover music so you can target high value spenders very deliberately. Hey, I've been uh, talking to a couple of people who are busy with data as well. Uh, uh, maybe it's my impression, but my impression is that the people who are working in data uh, uh, find it really, really important, but uh, the, the rest of the music world still has to learn a bit about it. Well, I, I think it depends. So there are good times to use data and bad times to use data. You could argue that when signing a band, you shouldn't actually care about the data because you've got an unformed, kind of unpolished entity that the average person looking at a diamond before it's been polished and cut doesn't understand what it is. An expert does. And so for me in A&R, there's an argument that says your expert should look at the talent that is before them, see the potential in that talent, and actually take that, develop it, and make it everything it can be, even though the data is screaming, no one's heard of these guys, what are you doing? That said, I think where data is improving in the music industry is that it's helping creatives answer their questions. And so it's about enabling and enhancing the understanding of the industry and so it's not about saying you should sign this band. But once they are signed and once they've got a creative product, let's research it, let's understand it, let's find out who the audience are so we don't make the wrong video, so we don't make the wrong artwork design, so that we don't market in the wrong places and spend a load of money. At that point, I think everyone agrees there is a role for data. The question is what is the balance between using data and people? And I think the rejection has been the suggestion that data is everything. I don't think in most situations data can't be everything. But combined with a smart person and some smart data, I think you get a better answer than from either on their own. Yeah. Hey, um, you, you um, um, <coughs> work for uh, 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 big companies, um, but if you uh, take it back to, say, say, say the, the level of an artist or, mm. or, or a small uh, label, where do you start with looking at data? Perfect. So we work with some small companies too, and we've worked with some artists. So we did a little bit for Catfish and the Bottle Men. Um, who got nominated for a Brit Award this morning. Um, and we've done some work with Ella Air. Um, but for us, fundamentally, for, for a young artist looking at this from even looking at their own numbers, so you maybe play to a room of 300 people, you're a young band. I think the key thing is, when you look at data, you've got to go with a question in mind. Because often people look at data and they expect answers without asking a question. And so whether it's understanding your Facebook interactions, and so you can see, have we got more Facebook interactions this time than last time? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? I think that's really valuable. Um, and I think for a young band, you look at what data you can get for free. For a mid-level band, you might look at spending some money kind of to do a consumer survey, look at the national population, understand your place in, 
in the national market. But for a young band starting out, I would understand your social media analytics first and foremost and understand your sales numbers. Yeah. Start there. Yeah, but but but, but okay. So you, you're doing that, and you say, okay, we 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 well, we have so many likes, so many plays on SoundCloud, whatever it is on on, on Bandcamp. But what we want is we want to become bigger. We want more people to to, uh, to know us and well, and, and hopefully then um, uh, to like us. So how do you go? Uh, how do you go from there? Well, absolutely. So I think marketing and awareness, particularly. So marketing for me does two things. It either makes more people aware of you, or it keeps the people who are aware of you engaged with you. And so I think with your marketing, you need to choose which of those things you are trying to do. So some of your Facebook posts will be trying to get new fans. Some of it will be engaging your existing fans. And some of it should really be asking your existing fans to go and get your new fans. For each of those, you can measure the success based on how many new people you have now liking your band page compared to the volume of interactions. If you're targeting your own fan base, you don't mind having no new likes because mm -hmm. it wasn't about getting new likes. So I think you've got to have that objective in mind as a band. What are we trying to achieve? Hey, uh, if I ask you, uh, what is an unimportant or the most important trend, say, in your field of expertise or in the music uh, and, and, and tech business at the moment, what do you say now? Um, so for me, I think using data well is genuinely an important trend. And I think the risk for data is there is a fascination with being able to answer every question one can think of. The skill is to limit yourself to the questions that are valuable. And by valuable, I mean they either tell you something you didn't know and you need to know, or they are actionable, so they help you make a decision based on that data. So when you look at data, think, okay, irrespective of what the data says, there are only three things I can do in response to it. Let me make sure the question I ask helps me choose which of these three things I can do. So having the answer in mind, data is not a miracle cure, it's a guide to answers that you should construct. Yeah. Hey, uh, we were talking a little bit uh, before the, but for this and, and we were looking at the question over here and one of them is which part of the music industry uh, needs disruption and then you said, well, disruption, I don't know. Well, for me, disruption seems to have this kind of, I don't know, almost Jedi power about it, that disruption is this amazing thing that people look up to. And I think there are right places for disruption. There's value added sometimes in disrupting a sluggish or kind of a disjointed industry structure to essentially look at a problem and fix it. But I feel that disruption alone is not enough. So for me, you get creative disruption and you get destructive disruption. I think the creative one that comes in and builds value for people, that respects the artist and the value chain, is really interesting. I think disruptions like I don't know, let's take piracy as an age-old example. There was a disruption that has led to f lower revenues for artists, lower revenues for the industry, and overall for a devaluation of music as a product overall. So for me, disruption is interesting when it creates and frustrating when it dis destroys rather than simply innovating. It's somehow held up as this holy thing that is to be looked up to. Disruption alone is not enough. Um, Sarah over here is, is, uh, is sitting over here. She's been to your uh, talk yesterday. Sorry about that. I've been been able to talk about your talk, but she uh, she is, and she she wants to ask a, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, maybe uh, join a little, uh, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. You hear a lot of uh, negativity um, around that data, and I think that is because. Um, for the consumer, it is not trans transparent. Um, can you tell us how it works from the beginning to the end? If you log in on your Facebook or, or your Spotify, what happens then? Well, so, so there's a tremendous amount that does happen. And so to take it, I guess, a, a, the biggest picture, anything you do online leaves a trail. And whether that's the websites you visit, whether that's the apps you use, everyone is collecting data along the way. And from an industry point of view, it's really interesting because before you would buy a CD, you would take it home. I don't know if you listen to it because I don't see the interactions along the way. I only see the one transaction. And so the fact we can now monitor listening behavior is really interesting, gives us much deeper understanding. And so platforms like Spotify will monitor what it's listened to. They have to, they have to pay royalties to labels, they have to pay royalties to publishers to make sure the people who created the music get paid. So they're tracking in some detail just to make sure that they can do what they need to do. They're also interested in their consumer base, so they will follow kind of, they'll, they'll ask you what your kind of age and gender is and whereabouts you're living roughly. But what's really important to understand is they do not pass that information on. So that information, they know about you, but you volunteer it. So you give them information. And that sits with Spotify. 
when Spotify then sends information to other people, they don't pass on your name, they don't pass on your email address, they don't pass on where you live, but they do give us indication of the kind of person you are so that we can group other people like you together and understand the marketplace. We're not so worried about understanding you as understanding big picture what's going on. Does that help? Yeah, so there are good um, privacy policy still that we don't know yet. Uh, yeah, and, and this stuff is massively complicated to explain and to, to really understand. So the European Commission has done a lot of work on improving privacy laws. The US is a slightly different kettle of fish or slightly different situation. Um, but essentially, national and transnational governments are doing a very good job of in putting laws and the technology companies are able to follow these. And so whilst it doesn't always feel like you're being protected, actually there, there are safeguards in place. And so to simply say that my data leaves and goes somewhere, you're probably better protected through formal services than maybe you are even from the companies that track your cookies without you really knowing what they're doing. Or even from, so when you open an email, sometimes it doesn't load the pictures. And that's because the pictures are hosted somewhere else. What happens then, so when you click that button that says, yes, please, I'd like to see the pictures, in order to retrieve that information, you have to hit their server. When you hit their server, it knows, you open the email, you engage with it at this time, what your IP address is, because it has to send the data to you, probably which device type you're using, so whether you're on your mobile or a tablet or on your PC. So there is a lot of information, always changing hands. But the thing to know is that you are safely looked after by the rules that exist, but we should be increasingly aware of what happens to our data when we interact online. Um, the other example, when you log onto a Wi-Fi network, they would have your device ID, but they have to send the Wi-Fi somewhere. But they also therefore know your unique device ID. They don't know you, but they know that you were there, or your phone at least was there. Yeah. Okay, and um, now you see that the consumer is uh, playing a passive role in the data, in the big data <laughs> cloud. <laughs> um, do you think that they can uh, become more active? That they can play an active role in it? How do you mean, sorry? That the consumer um, should become more involved in, in yes. what they give away or? Uh, Just in the whole process of... Um, um, yeah, I think so consumer rights groups have helped with the lobbying to make sure that consumers are looked after. Um, so from the legal perspective, I think it's happening on some levels. In terms of taking more personal responsibility for their own data, I think absolutely. So some people will set up a Facebook account that is just functional. So you use Facebook to log into, let's choose one, so a, a ticketing website or whatever else it might be. When you use Facebook for that, maybe you have a separate profile that gives away the information you're comfortable with, but not any more than you are comfortable with. Okay. And uh, last week, I um, someone told me about the platform yours. Do you know that? I'm not familiar, I'm afraid. Um, it's a platform that you can also block, and they say uh, we um, share it honestly, and you get also, if you block something and people are reading it, um, you get also money. We uh, earn money from it, but you, yeah, it's your blog, so you can can also get a part. What do you think about a platform like that? Well, I, I think it's an interesting concept. I don't know how many consumers are interested enough to spend the time. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges we've got overall in the economy at the moment is we're very much an attention economy. And fighting for everyone's attention is really hard. And keeping people engaged, keeping people interested is really hard. So I feel like for, for a small share of the population who are really, really interested in that kind of thing, mm -hmm. I think it'll be really interesting. Whether the average consumer is interested enough to interact with it more than once, because they might be interested to have a look. Mm -hmm. But that was the attention span, and now do they look again? Maybe not. So I think it's, a, it's certainly interesting information to have. But not for every uh, I don't think it's for everyone. I think Facebook should give us some money, us as users. We made, we made the, the platform a success. I, I could see the argument. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what I'm worth, and I'd be terrified to find out how much more valuable you two are than me. <laughs> but I, I, I see the argument. I, I'm not sure it will ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have more questions? Um, yeah. a, a one thing on that, sorry. I, a, I forget who said it, but someone once remarked, <coughs> If the product is, sorry, if something is free, you're not the customer, you're the product. No, oh, I'm uh, ready. ready. Finished? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, once again, uh, the festival, uh, the event you're organizing? Uh, the event we're organizing. Fast forward, so the website is 
www.fastforward.xyz. Um, 4th and 5th of February in Amsterdam, um, just next to the BIM house. Um, please look us up and come join us. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, watching. Uh, the rest of the day is, will be mainly for all the startups uh, over here, the startup competition, the startup pitches, uh, etc. So if you're watching live, keep on watching. And if you uh, watch this on demand on our YouTube channel or fastmovingtargets.nl, you will know that you can find all those pitches there uh, as well. Thanks. Thank you.